Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. The series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project, uh, the United States Department of Energy. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I'll be the host for today's webinar, facilitating uh, uh, lessons learned, developing a uh, performance portable QMC pack. And the webinar will be presented by Paul Kent. And yes, he'll be talking about the lessons learned he um, <laughs> during this um, uh, um, uh, ACP. Paul is a distinguished staff at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, principal investigator of the QMC PAC application development project within DOE's Department of Energy ECP, uh, and the director of the Center for Predictive Simulation of Functional Materials. And uh, this is funded by DOE's Basic Energy Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and previous ACM Gordon Bell, uh, Gordon Bell Prize winner. We have issued more than 100 tickets for today's webinar. Uh, we never know how many people will show up. All attendees have been muted upon entry. Uh, we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc, uh, whose address I'll paste into the chat momentarily. We have asked Paul to add breaks during his presentation so he can respond to the questions that come in. And with that, Paul, I'll stop my sharing here and you can please. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you just confirm that you can see the slides full screen okay? And yes. that the uh, audio is good. The audio is good. We can see the point, the slides and the pointer too. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, this opportunity to present. Uh, and thanks everyone who's online right now for your interest and also anyone who's watching this recording uh, in the future. So as I said, I'm the, the PI for um, QMC Pack. I'm going to be sharing some of our lessons uh, learned over the last uh, few years, making the performance portable uh, version of it. So the outline of this talk is, is very straightforward. I'm just going to say a little bit, very little about the science uh, that we're doing with the QMC PAC code and the Quantum Monte Carlo method that it implements. And then I'm going to be spending most of my time on or more general things that apply to you know, developers of other application codes. Uh, for example, performance portability goals, some of the challenges and rethinking we've had to do around using GPUs, and also our development approach, which I think is general to everyone. Uh, I certainly have a few what we think as, of, as uh, unique or novel points uh, there, but also I think there will be some points that people have heard other application developers say in this presentation series, and I want to add uh, our vote to what they've said as well. And so the sort of the background aim for this is I want to illustrate to you know, other code owners and developers what's been helpful in our case. Hopefully you can provide some inspiration. And I'm going to also point out some of our ongoing uh, pain points. It's by way of acknowledgement, uh, as was said in the introduction, this work has been funded by the Exascale Computing Project. And there's a bunch of people working on this code. And for brevity, I just want to particularly call out three people. Uh, Peter Doke at Oak Ridge and William Godoy at RNL and Yalo at Argon, who between them have been responsible for a lot of the design, implementation, and uh, testing work. It's been very important for us. I'd also like to call out collaborations with the ECP Solve project that is focused on improvements to OpenMP and LLVM. And then we've had a lot of very helpful conversations with staff at the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility and also the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. And actually, we wouldn't be where we were today without a lot of very helpful and encouraging uh, conversations with uh, engineers from all the major vendor in vendors involved here. So thanks to everyone at AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, and HPE for your input over the years. So let me start by saying a little bit about you know, Quantum Monte Carlo. Why are we going to um, go to all this, this trouble? Um, so what does Quantum Monte Carlo do? It's our flavor of it. Well, it's a method for computing the properties of materials and also molecules. And it's generally quoted as being the, you know, the most accurate and general approach for finding out uh, these problems of the ones that we have available on the market. 
And one of the reasons behind this is that unlike a lot of more cheaper, but sort of widely deployed methods is that uh, all the approximations, at least today, can be tested uh, in this uh, approach. And actually, today actually even begun to be made consistently smaller with application of more compute power. So that's one of the reasons why we're interested in HPC. The method is normally cubic uh, in the electron count, but the prefactor is really large. So the trade-off we have for these you know, improvable approach and a few approximations is that the computational cost is going to be very large. So orders of magnitude larger than many of the standard approaches. That said, the method um, is very accurate today and it can do the science that we're really called to. So it can be applied to materials, molecular systems, where some of the other methods that are used out there run into trouble and we would like to double check uh, the results they're given or just use the QMC results stand alone. And I'm not going to say you know, much more about this, but if anyone is, is interested, feel free to you know, send me an email. Uh, we also have uh, you know, a YouTube channel with results from our uh, last workshop we did with, with introductions to this methodology, and also a virtual machine where you can run a QMC pack and run some of the tutorials, for example. Just as an example of one of the areas of application, this is a very a simple one. You know, the question is, what is the most stable phase of a material? Uh, or in general, you know, what is the phase diagram of a material? What's stable under different conditions? Sometimes this is controversial and maybe even experiment can't completely resolve the, the issue with as much um, unambiguity as people would like. So for example, here, this is the system Titania. Uh, there's many crystal structures which sit around at standard room temperature and pressures, right? So they can't all be the ground state and clearly one of them is more stable. This is an area where you might want to bring in a very high accuracy theory. This is actually done a few years ago by two different groups um, with actually different codes able to throw some light on this problem and importantly, get the same general conclusions as well. So that's important to see, to have verification behind between different uh, methodologies. I'm not gonna be saying much about Monte Carlo in this talk, but just sort of a, a reminder here, we, have all the same sort of warm up or equilibration uh, procedures that you have in any Monte Carlo process. So this is a, a graph of a, a real you know, published run on uh, bulk vanadium dioxide. And we have this initial equilibration period till we start sampling actually the ground state, ground quantum mechanical state of the system. And then we start averaging. So that's, that's common to a lot of Monte Carlo. So that's a little bit of the background. So what are our goals on the software side? And I think this might be common to a lot of applications. So first of all, a number one goal is to be able to run well, so quite performantly, on the full range of hardware. So from a, a student laptop, which you know, possibly has an APU uh, in it, all the way through to the number one HPC machine, and importantly, on all of the three main vendor GPUs. So there's potential for a lot of variety here, which then leads us to our second goal, which is to the extent possible, we really want to have a single code path on all architectures. And very simply, that is going to reduce our ongoing maintenance burden. We're going to have fewer test configurations to do. Uh, and as a result of having less to focus on, what we have to focus on is going to be higher quality code. Um, so given that we actually tend not to have a single kernel to focus on actually quite a range of functionality, getting to a single code path is, is very important. And then the third point, of course, we do want to get the best performance we can out of the hardware we're running on. So we do need to retain the ability to use specialized hardware or libraries where merited. So for example, if there are some reprogrammable AI hardware that we could use in our simulations on some future piece of architecture, we want to make sure we can use that without a whole scale uh, rewrite, because again, that's not sustainable. So let me say a little bit about the QMC pack code. So what we're working with. Uh, so this is an open source code and it's fully openly developed on GitHub. So if you look at the, you know, the develop branch up there, that, that's what it is, right? And that's what we issue our quarterly uh, releases uh, from. And before going to technicalities, you know, as we're an open source code, I want to point out that we make a, a large effort to make sure all the contributors are credited in, for example, citation papers when we publish them. So for example, when we wrote the first citation paper for QMC pack a few years ago, 
we had 48 co-authors because we were able to track everyone who had touched the code because we'd always been in version control. So we want to give everybody credit. What do we implemented in? Where well, we're a C++ code, we use things like HDF5 and XML. And as I'll be describing in the course of this talk, we use OpenMP, both CPU threads, but now also target offload to GPUs. But we also have the, the flexibility to put in some CUDA or HIP or, or SICL, perhaps in the most performance critical kernel. And then of course we wrap the vendor uh, linear algebra libraries and so on. And a lot of effort has been done over the years to make sure the code vectorizes well, we have mixed precision support uh, and, and so on. Uh, I'm going to be describing some of the work that's that's gone into making the new design. And one of the key things about the new design, and I can only really describe it in, in these, these slides and the time that I, I have, is that our new design has got flexible dispatch. And very importantly, it solves the data movement problem where you treat the data movement problem. So that, for example, if you don't have a GPU, you can, of course, run on CPUs. But also, if there's a new piece of functionality which hasn't been implemented for GPUs yet, the code will still run, right, just on the CPUs and the data will be in the right place. Uh, some of you familiar with, familiar with QMC Pack will know we've been running on GPUs for about a decade now. Uh, and so we have this sort of legacy GPU implementation, and these points are the problems that old version didn't solve. So historically, if you try to use some functionality that hadn't been ported, the code would just stop. And this, of course, is not user-friendly. It's not good for science productivity. So that's something we've had to, to solve. Uh, and as I also note that as a result of uh, some of the testing and development procedure changes that I'm going to be mentioning, we've actually been able to go through several major transitions. Uh, so for example, when Knight's Landing came out, there was a transition from some of the data structures to from array of structures to structures of arrays and actually some more complex versions. Uh, that's uh, on the way, way out now, as I'll be describing. And also we recently just removed this so-called legacy GPU implementation. And that's a 40,000 line reduction in the amount of source code that we have. So a very important reduction. And we still have some ongoing cleanup work to do to reach our goal of having you know, primarily one code path uh, that's performance portable. So just a quick little side science note. I mean, we're not the only people running QMC pack. Uh, you know, besides the main developers, right? We want to grow a, a user base here. So the question is, you know, what are the st studies that are being done? So I grabbed three papers from the sort of the literature here, uh, and I'm going to be mentioning something about the electron count because that that's important uh, in terms of deciding how we can run performantly. So here on the left. Uh, I show a study by um, Dan Staros looking at chromium triiodide, one of the first claimed single layer uh, magnets. And this has about a thousand electrons in the calculations that were done. And that's, as I'm gonna be describing, is actually a reasonable number of electrons for us to do. So electron count that determines the amount of work we're going to have in our compute kernels. Now, if we look in the middle, uh, this is a result in PRL from, a, from earlier this year from Professor Seppler's group. Uh, looking at the phase diagram of hydrogen, and here the results of these accurate QMC calculations have been fed into machine learning. And of course, hydrogen is very light, so these calculations don't have many electrons, maybe about 100 in them. And of course, if this is determining the leading amount of work in our kernels, this is becoming much smaller and will be more difficult to accelerate than the, the first results. And then here on, on the right, I show actually a molecular result, which is, has even fewer numbers of electrons. Here, this is about 1,500 molecules run uh, high throughput, um, done in collaboration with Anatoly uh, Lilienfeld, again, used into machine learning. And of course, we would like to accelerate all of these. Uh, moving to the right is going to be more difficult because if we were to vectorize along the number of electrons, uh, well, these are going to be very short vectors, and the code will be taking proportionately more branches than in this thousand electron case. So that then brings me to the challenge of exploiting uh, GPUs. Of course, we want to run on NVIDIA's GPUs, AMD's GPUs, Intel's GPUs, and you know, future yet to be invented uh, accelerators. If we look at the current generation, they have you know something like 10,000 compute elements, however they're you know, labeled streaming multiprocessors in, in some way. 
And then each of those is going to need some number of operations in flight in order to run efficiently. So we might need 100, for example. So that you know, gets us to you know, about a million similar operations in flight that we're going to need for optimum performance. So for GPUs, we need coalesced reads and so on. And then very simply, if we only have 100 electrons, or maybe even 10,000 electrons on the large size, that is naively not going to be enough work to saturate the GPU. So we're going to have to do more than that. Uh, additionally, we don't have a single hot kernel in the calculations, maybe except for the very largest calculations. And just as background, we have a few that are compute bound, but the majority are more um, memory bound. Uh, and adding to uh, the homework that we have to worry about as co-developers is that quantum Monte Carlo techniques are much less mature than, say, quantum chemistry and classical molecular dynamics implementations. So there are simply fewer proven designs. Um, I think we're the only full production QMC code with a full GPU implementation. Now, I'm not going to be talking much about parallel scalability in this talk, in fact, only uh, this slide, because this is something that we've done the work on, and so we know we can scale over the current generation of machines. Uh, and we've had, had to do some work on this, and we do have to communicate every time step uh, in the Monte Carlo, which isn't ideal. But what saves us is that we have quite a large compute cost per time step. And so that means here on the left, we can see some strong scaling results. So basically ideal going up to 4,000 uh, summit nodes. And here on the right, we have some uh, weak scaling um, you know, from 200 to 1,500 electrons. Here's, you know, 100%, and you see we're, you know, above about 95% or so running on 4,000 nodes for these, this particular run. So, you know, not perfect, but within a, a few percent, um, well in the high 90s for a typical run. So to get high performance with QMC and QMC pack, our real focus is on getting the highest performance on the node and out of the GPUs and whatever other hardware there is there. So what are the main operations that we have to do and why is this a slightly different challenge to what we solve in some other problem domains? Well, we have two main classes of, of algorithm. We have some particle-based operations. So for example, we move electrons around, we need to compute distances, functions of position, do minimum image conventions. So there's some distances shown here in the sketch. And if this was periodic, we've got to do minimum image and so on. And we might only have, and this is done over the number of electrons, so we might only have thousands of electrons here, even in a large case. And this is very difficult from the millions or trillions that we might have in, in some MD simulation. And then in addition to particle operations, we also have some sort of vector and matrix operations, which is dense linear algebra, so, you know, blas one to three. Uh, there are some in basis set evaluation. Uh, we have to update the inverse of a determinant as I'll be describing in some later slides. And this is where the cubic part of the calculation comes from. And again, that's dense. Uh, and there's also some other functionality I'm not going to be describing uh, in this uh, talk. The thing to note is that these are done over matrices of size of the number of electrons. So again, this isn't very large. So just some, some, some questions and maybe some differences from other areas. You know, if we only have a, a few hundred of electrons, it's, it's not obvious that it's worth maintaining neighbor lists. Obviously, in the, in the large electron limit, it would be, but if we have very few, it, that's less clear. Similarly, it doesn't seem clear, it doesn't seem obvious that we should use any sparsity that's in the problem because the matrices are very small. And the sparsity is actually quite small. So how do we do, how do we decide what the design uh, should be for now and, uh, you know, learn how to implement those operations for GPUs. Well, what was productive for us was to write a mini app. It's called mini QMC, and it's also up on in GitHub, and we run CI on it and so on, just as we do the main uh, application. And this was made by cutting down QMC packs. So it's more than an order of magnitude smaller, but does retain a lot of the real world complexity. And actually, to make sure that the mini app reflected the main application, we did quite a bit of careful profiling. And that's shown here on the right. Of course, profiling is easier to do on a, a smaller code. So what's shown here is that in a fraction of runtime for problems of various electron, various numbers of electron count, and the light bars are, is the profile from the mini app. And the slightly darker ones, I, I do hope this is visible on, on Zoom, um, 
are from the main application. And we can see the distribution, for, you know, the different flavors of operations is similar. Uh, not exactly the same, so the memory layouts are different. We've reduced the number of operations, but generally, you know, the, the same trends are reproduced. That meant we could experiment with the implementation route and also the design. Uh, and as a result of this, we, you know, we came up with this uh, new design, uh, wholly changing the internal APIs in the application for the QMC execution, where we can have flexible um, dispatch to, to CPUs, GPUs, or different implementations. Um, and as I think some of the audience uh, know, we basically picked OpenMP target offload as our preferred route, but because of the flexibility of the design, we can supplement it by vendor-specific optimized code or you know, even other C++, for example, um, as we see fit. So that's the flexibility of the new design. Uh, one thing I would note, though, is that so it's been very helpful to have this mini app, but just like the main application, the mini app requires ongoing uh, care and, and feeding. Uh, so actually, if anyone is you know, interested in looking at this, I should note it's, it's slightly out of date at the moment because the resources we have have to have been um, focused on the main application. So for example, someone tried the, the Cocos version, which we hadn't touched in a long time, and this um, wouldn't build out of the box with today's Cocos. It might just need 30 seconds of work, but we hadn't done that, that work. So do contact us um, if you run into something like that. So these mini apps do require some you know, ongoing maintenance to, to keep uh, being representative of the main application and working. So now let me move to the sort of the main algorithmic challenge we had in uh, Monte hey, Carlo on how, go ahead. Is this a good time for a, quick, a question here? Or? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, so it goes back some slides. Uh, is the data movement managed managed using unified memory or? No, uh, it's a good, very good question. We explicitly moved the memory. We didn't feel confident in relying on high performance managed memory from all the architectures that we'd want to run on. And of course, we also want to run on you know, older hardware and so on that perhaps someone in their research group uh, might have, you know, not at a big facility. Uh, and so we knew we had to explicitly manage memory ourselves. And so the interface, the OpenMP uh, to unify the memory, does it require any specific uh, version of uh, OpenMP, like OpenMP5 or? I'll... So, so yes, there are. I, I don't remember the specific version that we do need, but the point is, you need the hardware support there. You need the driver support, and it has to be efficient. So we didn't go that route. Okay, uh, go on, please. Yeah, that's, that's a good. That's a good question. Yes, had we been we be doing this in a few years, maybe we could have gone fully managed memory, and that would have been a huge simplification. So we'd really like to see that everywhere, but it wasn't around uh, at the time we we're making these decisions. So, so let me talk now about the algorithmic challenge. So how do we map QMC to the GPUs? And so this is a bit Monte Carlo specific, but I'm, we're going to arrive at a, a recipe, which I think can be used by other codes in other application domains for higher performance. So how does the sort of canonical Monte Carlo work? Right? We have some sort of time stepping loop and we're gonna do a lot of those. We then have some loop over Markov chains in the Monte Carlo, and we normally call those walkers uh, in the, that's the slang in the, in the field. And of course, you know, we could put one walker per CPU core, uh, very, very straightforward. There's a straightforward map to mapping to CPUs there. And then we have a loop over the electrons. And inside this, then we have the compute kernels where we do the sorts of things that you'd expect in a Monte Carlo. So for example, we propose moving a given electron, we then evaluate the wave function at a new position. We have an accept, reject step, and so on, you know, with the measure properties, et cetera. The issue is when we look at the compute cost inside for these uh, you know, kernels in this inner loop, uh, we see that you know, if n was 100 or even 10,000, it's not going to be large enough to fill the GPUs because they're only going to be n and squared, maybe even one uh, in some case. So there's not enough work in this canonical algorithm. So how is this solved? And I want to call out um, Ken Esler, who essentially solved this in QMC pack in the CUDA version, basically 10 years ago now. And the approach, which I think is sort of common to a lot of codes, was to realize, okay, we could batch up, we need to batch up similar work. 
So what we did was to batch up the work over many uh, Walker moves and updating of many Markov chains. So when we uh, look at the algorithm now, we have the time step loop, but then that explicit loop over Walkers or Markov chains is gone. We then have the loop over electrons. And when it comes to moving, uh, moving electrons, for example, this first kernel, we try and up we update M, so the batch size, number of walkers simultaneously. So all these are different moves, <clears throat> but if we have, if we set M to be 10 or 100,000, whatever fits in the GPU memory, now this operation starts to have enough work in it. So M times uh, N squared, for example, for some of these uh, operations. And if we think of M, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if if M is uh, you know in the hundreds and N is also in the hundreds, then we start to get to the uh, hundreds of thousands and, and millions of operations that we need to keep the GPU satisfied. So this actually works very well, um, but we did notice some inefficiencies about this sort of in the real world that we felt we needed to address, and that brings me to our new approach. And our new approach uses multi, multiple threads to offload smaller batches of walkers, which we're calling crowds, to the GPU. And in this sketch, I'm going to explain why we do this and why it is, uh, has the potential for higher efficiency overall. So what we have in this sketch, we have some sort of time uh, axis. And this first row is sort of the old algorithm. So we have a single batch of walkers or a single crowd, and we're going to have two operations. We're going to evaluate some orbitals, and then we're going to evaluate some determinants. And we're going to pretend that this is a lot of work, enough to more than saturate the GPU uh, in this example. So of course, saturating the GPU is good. It's what we're, we're taught in our GPU tutorials. But the issue actually is not when the GPU is occupied. The problem is this gap. Right, the problem, uh, and this is a gap where we're going to do some CPU work, because in the real world, it turns out that no matter how much use of asynchronous operations uh, we use to try and uh, keep the GPUs busy, there's going to be some points where we need to do some CPU work and we're not able to keep the GPUs busy. And of course, that's the problem because the GPUs are our most precious resource uh, and we don't want to have any period where the GPUs are not fully occupied. So the problem is the gap. So how do we treat that? Well, what we're going to do is break up the work here into three crowds. And as a result, we are able to get in a problem and software and hardware dependent man manner, higher throughput. So how does that work? Well, if we're going to break up this initial operation into three, and in this you know, mentally contrived example, uh, we're going to pretend, you know, we've, we've launched all this work at a similar time, but the first two kernels here fully occupy the GPU, and this third one can't start. That's what this empty box is meant to indicate. So this third part of the last third of the work has to wait. Of course, once this first one finishes, this third one can start, but also it can then get to work on its gap before launching the next kernel. And then if everything conspires correctly, you know, as a result of doing this, we can potentially have higher throughput. And this, of course, is actually talked about in some GPU tutorials, you know, towards the end as a, as a means of potentially getting higher throughput. Um, here we've implemented it in the main, in a, a full application, and we are, as I'll show you, getting higher throughput from it. So what we do is trade off a little bit of kernel efficiency by having smaller chunks of work with greater asynchronicity uh, in this case. Uh, one thing to note, though, is that we could choose just to use one crowd and recover the original sort of GPU algorithm we've been using for some years. So we can only become more efficient uh, in this scheme, provided we can choose the crowd size uh, appropriately. So the point here, you know, for other applications is to, yes, do think about generating large kernels to occupy the GPUs, but also pay attention to the gaps and whether you can break up the work in order to get better overall throughput. Uh, another area where actually this is actually very helpful is suppose we have an operation that is you know, explicitly CPU bound, perhaps because we've just written it for the first time. In this new scheme, we have a better chance to hide it. 
um, than in the old scheme when we'd probably just be awfully exposed and, and hurt a lot in performance. Just some uh, real world uh, results on this. This is results from a mid-sized problem with 1500 electrons. And what I'm plotting here on the y-axis, this is throughput, so higher is better. And the x-axis is the total amount of uh, work on uh, the GPU, uh, total, total work is on the GPU. Uh, and so we hear the sort of the traditional upwards curve uh, in efficiency and throughput as we make batch sizes larger. Uh, what happens if we have two crowds launched from two threads, or in this case running on um, Summit LCF, so V100s, we get significantly higher throughput. Uh, and if we look at higher threads, we see four roughly doubles our throughput for this particular problem on this particular node. Uh, but actually eight breaks up the work too much. So presumably we lose too much in, in kernel efficiency for this particular problem. And we've looked at this for both smaller and larger runs, and we see variants uh, of it where we can get higher, higher performance using this multi-thread scheme. So that is something we're using in, in full production today. Uh, the code up on GitHub does this. But in addition to that, we've also looked at all the key algorithms in the application. Um, I won't, I'm always, uh, I think it's always noteworthy if when we look at an application, there's an algorithm that hasn't been updated for many years, perhaps even decades. And there can be a chance there to revisit, particularly on current hardware. And so there's a number of cases where we've been able to replace some of the older algorithms using QMC with new algorithms that are more compute bound and less memory bound. Uh, and one example I'm just going to mention here, the key n cubed operation in QMC is related to updating of a determinant. And we have a new so-called delayed update algorithm, which is not only higher performance as I'll show on the right, but I'm mentioning here because there's something counterintuitive about it in that it has many more operations or more operations in it than the older algorithms. Uh, the key advantage though, is that the operations can take better use of matrix accelerators found on not just modern GPUs, but also on uh, modern CPUs. Uh, and so as a result, it can run with a much higher performance. So it becomes more compute bound than memory bound uh, historically. So for those familiar with matrix updates, what we've done is to adopt the Sherman Morrison Woodbury scheme to obtain inverse determinants for some delay period. And then we do a full update. And for intermediate periods, we can obtain the effective value of the, of the inverse. And we've got some tricks to avoid recalculating intermediates to keep the amount of extra work down. Uh, so this is actually an improvement on an earlier version that we had. But the, generally, the point here is that we transition to more a more matrix multiply rich uh, algorithm, which, of course, is going to be less uh, memory bandwidth starved than the older schemes uh, that we use, the traditional rank one update. So here on the right, I show performance on an A100 of this new scheme. The green is for 768 electrons. And you see here that with you know, 30 delays or so, we're a few tens of percent faster. And if we look at a 3,000 electron problem, with just a reasonable delay of you know, 30, 60 or so, we're actually twice as fast overall uh, in the entire run. So this is well worth having, and actually the code will switch by um, default. And now when you're running a large enough system. So this is really helpful on GPUs and I'm not showing it here, but you probably realize, of course, this helps even more on CPU systems because those are much more memory bandwidth starved. So that's all I want to say about you know, updates to the algorithms and design. And now we're gonna to transition to our development approach. Unless there are any burning questions I should answer right now. <laughs> there is one, Paul. Uh, uh, are you using NVIDIA GPU MPS on Summit and Permuter for the multiple crowd approach or only relying on asynchronous GPU kernel launches? We do not rely on MPS. Uh, and there's several reasons behind this. First of all, our approach is more efficient than MPS. And we it's very important for us that we can share, mem uh, we minimize the number of MPI tasks that we have on the node because we have some fairly large lookup tables, for example, that will consume all the GPU memory. So it's very important that we don't uh, replicate those. So having multiple threads offload implemented with OpenMP or CUDA or anything else, however that's done, it's important that 
that works well and we can do it from the minimum number of MPI tasks that the system allows us to use to drive the GPUs. And how do you manage multiple CPU threads uh, called stalking to the same GPU? Uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning, we've had a effective collaboration with a lot of compiler teams and the, and the, and the Solve projects and quite a few of the vendors. Um, so this is where the runtime has to be able to efficiently dispatch these tasks into, for example, streams or whatever is the appropriate match on the vendor side. So what we don't want to have happen is to have our separate threads of work, which we know are independent, uh, interfere with each other. Uh, so for example, um, maybe a year ago now, I don't remember the act date, um, NVHPC gained an option to basically set up that, um, that mapping, uh, which is very beneficial to our code. And you can do this in the other compilers as well. This is gone. All right, so let me talk about our developmental approach here, which is of course um, uh, general, and we have got some sort of unique suggestions for um, and other co-developers here. So what is our general approach here? Um, this first bullet point might seem very obvious, but I think it's it's well worth saying. One can get very deep into rabbit warrens in, in describing you know, development practices, uh, but really there's a straightforward way of, of assessing, you know, are they helping or not, right? Just, you know, are they improving um, how we make use of our time, right? So we want to have approaches that make the best use of our time. Uh, there's a lot of best practices out there, and of course, one can adopt them incrementally. And of course, the key thing to realize is that you know, if you're not using these already, after you've been adopting the, after you've used them for a number of months, you've got some data from how you're doing code reviews, for example, how your continuous integration testing is going, and you can refine based on what makes sense for your team and your code. Hence, the pragmatic word here is, is very important. Uh, one thing also we to note here is that you know we're an open source code. We can't force a particular tool set on anyone who might be uh, contributing. That would be very unproductive. So we also want to make sure that we keep the barrier for new developers low, right? So we can get drive-by contributions. So you know forcing someone to run Clang format themselves, for example, would add add a, potentially add a barrier. Uh, and similarly to help with that, uh, and just, just overall, we put quite a bit of effort to limiting the required uh, dependencies needed to build the code. We have uh, a luxury compared to some applications that we can actually do this. And one thing that's helped is that we actually have a, a written down support policy for compilers and libraries. And basically we support uh, com you know, compilers for a two year uh, window. And if you're using a vendor specific compiler in that window, we might, um, request for you to use a specific version. We try not to block older compilers, of, of course, again, to keep the barrier for new developers down. Just as a really simple, perhaps obvious example of, of something that, that helps many of these areas, uh, we transitioned all of our documentation from uh, LaTeX to use restructured text, Sphinx, and uh, read the docs. And you know this this might seem quite straightforward, but the ramifications are important because it now means the barrier to documentation edits is very low. Right, essentially anyone can just click on GitHub and you know edit a file, put in a, a pull request if there's just a typo. For example, we've had people do that, and of course we get full continuous integration on these changes very straightforwardly through read the docs that we didn't before. Now, let me talk now about uh, the key ecosystem challenge, uh, and that is version control. And I don't mean version control of source code, I mean version control of specific versions of all the dependencies uh, that we depend on. Uh, now, I said we make an effort to keep the number of dependencies down, but here if we plot this diagram, which is probably impossible to, impossible to read, this is actually the diagram produced by a SPAC for really one of the minimum sets of QMC pack dependencies. And it doesn't actually include the compilers, which would make it much larger, and many of the optional Python dependencies. So we have QMC pack. I see FFTW here, HDF5, CMake, uh, and so on. So the point here is that you know even us as a low dependency application have got a lot of dependencies. Uh, all of these dependencies are going updates at their various rates, and so we need a way of getting a grip of this, right? Because for example, suppose there's a new version of HDF5 which has a 
uh, an incompatible API with previous versions, we need to make sure that we can test that and also you know, still run uh, previous versions. And of course, all changes in any of these can lead to, to breakage either for the developers or worst case you know, for the users. And we don't want that to happen. So the way we've gotten grip of, of, of this, at least in our nightly testing and in some of our um, CI is to become uh, heavily invested in using the SPAC package uh, manager. There's a, a link here. It's been subject of uh, other talks in this series and there's certainly others online. And the important thing about having a, a version aware package manager uh, is that then means we can install um, both older and newer versions of all of this software. So for example, in our nightlies, we intentionally cover a sparse matrix of you know, many versions of compilers uh, and libraries. Uh, and we do that with full reproducibility. So this gives us you know, sparse testing coverage in a way we've, we can control, uh, saves a huge amount of uh, human time. I don't think the testing we do would be possible uh, you know, the old by hand way. Of course, we do have to bear in mind this is only sparse coverage. And in general, you know, users are going to use any combination of, of versions they happen to, to find on a system. And I would say actually um, investing in SPAC was probably the number two um, return on investment in terms of uh, you know, making better use of our time. So I'd very, very much recommend it. Uh, what was the number one uh, return uh, on investment, I think, for the development team? And that is making a lot of investments in testing and continuous integration. I know other presenters in the series have mentioned this. I want to add you know, our vote to this as well. Uh, so what we now have is quite a large set of unit uh, deterministic and also stochastic integration tests. So we have some special considerations as we're a stochastic code with random numbers. So we've got, we're in the, the thousands now of formally counted tests. And this means then that we can run a subset of these tests in continuous integration. So whenever anyone makes a, a pull request on the code, this is probably sort of viewers on GitHub is probably familiar to much of the audience. Uh, we can you know, test uh, quite a few uh, configurations there. And then we run a more extensive set of tests nightly uh, and weekly. And we do that to get access to more compiler combinations. Uh, but also to run on more CPUs and also specifically more GPUs, as we have very limited access to, to GPUs, at least with free GitHub actions. And of course, having a, a, an extensive testing framework helps us keep the code correct or, or, and, a, and a minimize the chance of new bugs cra crawling in. But I'd like to call out some other benefits. Right? We made some very large changes to the code, unless lets us do so with confidence. It's helpful for onboarding new developers and also engaging with, with vendors or drive-by uh, contributors. For example, we can tell people that, you know, provided they, uh, if they make a, uh, an improvement to the code and they make a, a pull request, provided the tests pass, then it's very likely that we're going to merge it. And then it's on, you know, us as the uh, you know, sort of domain scientists, uh, if there's any problems as a result, that contributor doesn't need uh, to worry. So this is obviously very helpful with working with uh, non-specialists. So what happens uh, when someone proposes a, a change to the code? Of course, there's a human review. Uh, there's a running of you know, unit and integration tests. We have coverage reporting. We're also running um, sanitizers for memory and undefined behavior and so on. Uh, we also have some procedures around reviews. So for example, um, anyone is welcome to review a pull request, but the person who actually does the merge um, is, shouldn't be at the same institution as someone involved in the pull request. So that potentially avoids some conflict of interest and you know, get some independence uh, into the reviewing uh, process. How do we do the CI? Well, I, I mentioned we use GitHub uh, Actions and we use our own hardware. And so one of the issues why we need to use our own hardware is, for example, MI200 series GPUs are not available, at least when I'm speaking to the best of my knowledge, on Azure or AWS. And so we want to run the, you know, the code uh, on those. And then also because we own some of our own hardware, it gives us the freedom to put new GPU drivers on it very quickly. Um, you know, so for example, when a uh, new version of Rockham came out the other week, you know, the same day we were able to install it and start running our tests uh, on it. And we might not be able to do that with cloud infrastructure or infrastructure that we don't own. And the reason for this is that we want to help the community as much as we can, right, as well as finding out what issues we have with our own code. 
because if someone is making, let's say, quarter releases of a particular software project or GPU drivers, by the time we get a version, they're already alpha or beta testing internally the next version. So the window to get fixes into the next release uh, is quite small. Uh, one thing I would call out uh, that's actually been a nice time and frankly, you know, resource savings for us is that with OpenMP target offload, um, in addition to compiling for a specific GPU, such as, you know, an A100, H100 or an MI250, um, one can also compile targeting the host CPU. So this LLVM will let you do that. And so this means that we can exercise our quote unquote GPU code paths on a CPU system without needing to commit more costly GPU resources to that testing. So this is a very useful uh, first layer. Um, and this would be good to see in other technologies uh, besides uh, OpenMP. Now to keep this um, you know, grounded in the real world, let me give some examples of some of the problems that we've caught uh, doing this. Um, of course, since we have this testing regimen, when we do find a problem, we can add a test to avoid it, finding it, finding it again in future. Uh, over time, we've been able to focus our effort on sort of more critical areas, which we know we need to be take more care of uh, in updates. And as I was just mentioning, we are trying to provide feedback to the community. I'm going to have an example of this. But, you know, if we find a problem in the wider software infrastructure that we're also testing, we are now able to give quite prompt feedback to the relevant developers, usually with a reproducer, but not always. So some examples of some real world problems that we've, we, we run across. So in, in QMC pack, um, you know, we've learned over time that the state machines we use in the Monte Carlo code to make it a, a very efficient and avoid recalculating anything we don't need to recalculate, they're a very sensitive area and difficult to have full coverage of uh, in, the, in the testing. So it's a Monte Carlo specific area where bugs can creep in. But a second area I think is much more general. And that is early in the code's lifetime, some of the optional features were implemented via defines and if defs. For example, do you, are you building a real version of the code or the complex math version of the code? And this is again an area where there can be slightly less coverage and problems can, can turn up uh, because of course these, when you have defined, you need separate builds, separate sets of tests potentially. And this can be a small area of weakness. So we're working to get rid of, of that and use more use of generic programming, which is actually quite widely used in QMC pack. Uh, some examples of problems in the wider software stack. Well, uh, I think many in the audience uh, let me speak on this before. We've had many issues with uh, maturation of the OpenMP target offload uh, compilers. Um, found issues with, with all of them, but as I've noted, with the latest releases of LLVM, we can target NVIDIA in production. Uh, in the wider software stack, we've also had issues in libraries. So with our testing that we have, we've been able to catch incorrect results from some linear algebra libraries. And more recently, actually, we found a, an issue with threading in OpenBlas on, on CPUs. And I'd like to thank the OpenBlas developers for fixing this really quickly. Actually, that, that's really appreciated. Uh, so this is fixed in the, you know, the latest releases. Uh, we found that depending on how you'd compiled OpenBlas, it could change the number of threads in the calling uh, program. And this will result in not just broken tests, but incorrect results uh, in our case. So this was promptly fixed and we're able to catch it in our testing and, and route that back to the to general ecosystem. And finally, yes, we are using spec, but there are many transient packaging and compatibility issues. And right now, the only way to treat those is just to have enough human resources uh, wrangling these uh, on the problem. So not everything is automatic and a lot of uh, maturation is still needed. You might be wondering where we are as regards uh, performance. Well, this is not a talk where I'm gonna go into all the, the, the performance on, on different architectures. Uh, but I do want to indicate where we are with LLVM targeting NVIDIA, because as of about September of last year, so release 15 of LLVM, we were able to transition to using this performance portable code that I mentioned for actual science uh, production uh, with full capabilities available, as I described in, in the design. So what I'm showing here on the y-axis, I'm showing throughput, so higher is better. The x-axis, excuse me, is atoms and not electrons. Uh, there's about five, no, there's 6,000 in this 500 atom uh, case. 
And uh, this 1.0 is the performance that we would get with our older um, non-general GPU uh, implementation. So I want to note very clearly, this is not an apples to apples comparison because we've changed quite a few algorithms. But what I'm showing in this bar chart is the progression in the performance of the code, moving both with uh, newer versions of LLVM up to the one of the 15 uh, release versions, and also improvements in QMC pack. So there's several things conflated here. But what you can see is that we're competitive uh, with the old version. And of course, all the functionality uh, works, unlike the old version, because we've solved the data movement problem. So before wrapping up, let me mention a couple of the on ongoing challenges that we're dealing with. Um, very clearly, you know, more maturation of the ecosystem is needed. And so we think having, you know, Frontier and Aurora and Polaris and so on, you know, online uh, is not going to be really helpful and is very much uh, necessary. So we've still got a ways uh, to go here. Um, in terms of a CI, uh, we found it very helpful not just to have a sort of a stable CI system, but also sort of a leading edge uh, CI so that we can have the latest versions of GPU drivers and other software. Uh, available on them. And of course, we're doing that with our own hardware. And you know, we recognize it's not practical for everybody, but it really has uh, helped our development uh, velocity and provide feedback to you know, vendors and, and library developers uh, much more rapidly than we would have to otherwise. Uh, one slight blind spot we have at the moment uh, is that we actually don't deploy our software onto the facilities you know, where, it's, where it's going to be run. So having automated testing at the facilities would be very helpful. Uh, for example, uh, we're not going through the Cray HPE software stack in our testing. So if there's an issue with the compiler wrappers or something special about the MPI or just something unique about the particular facility that we're running on, we don't catch that right now. And what we'd really like and would find very helpful would have be you know, some robot that builds our code, maybe the last release, and then sends us an email if after an operating system update, there's been some breakage. We don't want to find out there's a breakage when some student is running the code and they're on deadline to produce a poster, for example. We want to catch it as soon as possible after the, the breakage could have been caught. And finally, a more computer science or computational science question that you know, if, if we have time and resources, we'd really like to, to, to focus on. And that's the question, can we get you know, peak performance, more or less full performance using OpenMP target offload, perhaps with the current standards or some future tweaked versions of it? Or will we always need a little bit of more vendor specific code? So sickle or hip, whatever it happens uh, to be. How close can we get? Because we'd really like to get to having as that common code path um, for as many architectures as possible and as few uh, you know, additional vendor-specific implementations uh, to support. Also thinking along those lines, uh, we'd be interested in looking at you know, what is needed in future C++ standards. Of course, there's various proposals, you know, MD span is going in and so on, but we need, know we need more than that in future versions. Uh, the question is what exactly would be needed to make mainline QMC pack or just the mini app uh, run with the performance we have today or even better. So future work. So then just to wrap up, I'd be happy to take many more questions. So I have to note, you know, making a performance portable Quantum Monte Carlo code of the flavor of Quantum Monte Carlo we're doing has been quite a challenge. As I mentioned, we don't have, you know, a single hot kernel that we can, can port over and be done. Um, but that said, uh, we do now have performance portable QMC pack being used uh, in science uh, production. So we think we've got the right design. And we think the code that we have on GitHub today is, is basically what's going to be running on all the architectures that I've mentioned in this talk. We do have some ongoing challenges to deal with. So for example, taming, taming memory usage on the GPUs or being able to distribute the memory somehow would be tremendously impactful in the science that we can do. And we also have a lot of science features to do that don't show up on a figure of merit in terms of speed, but are very relevant for scientific impact. So we've got a lot more implementation uh, to do. But to move to the main point I was hoping to make uh, in this talk, I hope it's you know, provided more evidence that having modern development practices is really impactful and has been very helpful to us. And so particularly the, in the area of testing, this has helped us improve code quality, let us do some quite large changes to the code and really help 
uh, improve our efficiency overall. Of course, to get this return, one does need to make uh, an investment. And so it's important not only to have the, you know, the, the, the hardware resources to do the testing on, for example, but it's very important to have you know, supported research software engineers so we can benefit from their ideas and experience and improve the overall quality. So on that note, um, thank you very much for your interest and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Nice. Uh, yeah, some questions came uh, through uh, in the chat, but I and they pasted in the Google Doc. And I think one of your collaborators has been answering the questions. Thank you. I don't know who that person is, but I see that the question is being answered. One that remains here is the is the delayed uh, going back some slides. Is the delayed update algorithm numerically equivalent, or are you trading some accuracy? So it's a good question. It is the equations are equivalent, but the numerics are not exactly the same. Uh, in practice, the accumulation of errors appears to be more or less the same as the traditional rank one update. But it is certainly something that we, you know, we've investigated and, and we think about. It's a good question. Okay, so now um, we have uh, some minutes, I think. So um, I would invite the participants to, if there are uh, any further questions, uh, to unmute themselves and ask directly to uh, to Paul if there's any question from the audience. Any? Last question here from folks. <laughs> well, if someone thinks of one in future, I'm very happy to take uh, you know an email on it or have a follow-on uh, conversation because there's uh, we've only been able to describe at a high level uh, some of the many considerations that we have uh, in this application. Yeah, but it looks like you have answered everything. <laughs> Just uh, then, uh, if you know further questions from the audience, from the participants, uh, we'll ask Paul to go through the questions and the Q and A, and um, and just do some cleaning, and we'll make them available. <clears throat> the slides will be available as soon as <clears throat> Paul, I think, get the slides. Yeah, I'll uh, make them available. Cleared by uh, Oak Ridge. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, everyone.